What's up, Tweeners? Welcome back to another Tweener Tennis Video City here on the channel. And today we have one of the most special interviews I think I have ever done and that I have been privileged to talk to. And we've talked to Rick Macy. Yes, the Rick Macy. One of the first coaches to ever coach Venus and Serena Williams. Starred in King Richard, the real story of Venus and Serena Williams with Will Smith. I don't think I've ever been able to learn and appreciate someone like Rick in a very long time. And I am so grateful that he was able to sit down and talk to me about what it's like teaching juniors, what it's like teaching parents about the junior game, what it was like teaching Venus and Serena, the movie that he was a part of. I, I am just so grateful to have him on this channel. And I'd really appreciate you guys showing your support by leaving a like on this video and consider subscribing to the channel. I would love for you guys to consider that and I hope you guys do enjoy this interview. This was a lot of fun. And go show Rick some love on Instagram, YouTube, all of those social medias down in the description below. If you want to go follow him, let's go. Our interview with the Rick Macy. Perfect. Rick, this is such a pleasure. I can't believe I'm talking to a legend himself. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more, than more than happy to do it. I obviously have done... Uh, quite a few of these for a long time, but uh, as you could imagine, a lot more the last month. Well, uh, obviously because of the King Richard movie, and that's a great place to start because for you, having a movie not just made about yourself, but the Williams sisters, how long was this in the process? Were you fully involved with the movie? Um, great question. No, I wasn't. You know, um, even though, you know, John Bernthal reached out to me and Mm -hmm. you know, took the temperature. We had multiple conversations and uh, obviously uh, he read my book and he did a lot of research. He talked to a lot of people that I coached actually. Um, and that's probably the best way to get a feel of kind of who I am or what I've done over you know my lifetime is just ask other people besides myself. And uh, so he did a lot of research and then Richard Williams himself mm -hmm. had so much video you have no idea it's crazy he had so much video so just studying it um so that's the extent i wasn't consulted on the on the, oh, wow. the movie movie at all but um at the end of the day it, it came out amazing and i'm glad to be a part of it it it's amazing by the way you look great in the tux i just have to point that out there right now <laughs> for for you though before the williams sisters before the academy where did you get your coaching style from? Did you develop it from anyone else or did you kind of take it from someone that you, that inspired you? You know, first off, another great question. And I've been asked thousands of questions and no one's really asked me that, you know? And um, so I'm kind of glad you did, you know, at the end of the day, I, I picked up a tennis racket when I was 12 years old. I used to be really good at golf. I grew up in a small town of Greenville, Ohio. And, uh, you know, 10,000 people and we lived a half mile from the uh, tennis courts in a park and I just picked up a racket at 12 and fell in love with the game and by 18 years old I was I was number one in the Ohio Valley I mean I got real good real quick and played a lot of sports basketball so um, and I kind of had to do everything on my own you know my dad hmm. passed away when I was 10 years old and so you know I think from that I got a lot of mental strength just going through all that and became a pretty decent player at the end of the day. But I always had, I think, more of a gift to communicate and I cared about others more than myself. Maybe mm -hmm. it's those Midwest qualities that I grew up <laughs> with and how I was raised. And um, I always liked to analyze things. You know, it was, it was crazy. Even as a kid, I'd go to the movie with my friends and five minutes into the movie, I'm telling everybody how it's going to end. And no one wanted to sit with me, you know, I'm, I'm by myself. I'm, I'm by myself as a teenager. So no, I think all these things and um, you acquire the knowledge as you go along. Mm -hmm. But even early on, when I started teaching at like 21, 22 at an indoor club in Ohio, mm -hmm. um, even the guy there said, you know, I had something very unique. And, um, but I just love to be on the tennis court. I love to help others. So, you know, without getting bogged down and kind of get to the finish sign here, uh, I grew up in a, uh, a small town. I lived a half mile from a park. Here I am at 67. I just had a birthday last week. So I live a half mile from the park now. My wow. career's come full circle. It's named Rick Macy Tennis Center. 
and you know all the accolades and all the accomplishments but to answer your question it's always been my own style you know i was influenced wow. a little bit by james lair the mm -hmm. pioneer in sports psychology so um, i was always intrigued about mental toughness so probably brian gordon who's a you know has a phd in biomechanics he's a very good friend of mine so those two people probably had the most influence but at the end of the day it's how you communicate, how you connect the dots, how you motivate, educate. And I think being genuine and how I can, whether it's a four-year-old or an 80-year-old or someone who's top 10 in the world that's in front of me, it's being able to adapt. And the, the one thing I like probably more than anything, I'm exactly the same way now as I was back then. I haven't changed at all. And I still teach 50 hours a week of private lessons, seven days a week. No, it's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like even at once you get older in your life, you feel like you would decrease the number of hours and you would go into a more manageable management role, but you just seem to keep pressing on just like you were when you were teaching the Williams sisters. Yeah, it's exactly the same. I actually even do more. I probably teach more than anybody in the country. I get up every day at three 30. Uh, I have for 25 years. Why? Uh, I, I, I'm just, you know, you get in habits, you know, I go to bed like nine o'clock. I just always gotten up early. And, you know, once I get up, I'm, I'm ready to go. You know, it's, wow. it's always, I've always been that way. And I start teaching at six before the kids go to school because a lot of them have school in the morning. So, and I teach seven days a week. You know, I love being on a tennis court. And uh, obviously I knew early on, I kind of had a gift. And I don't think it's so much like, you know, five number one players who became number one or eight Grand Slam champions or, the 300 and some USTA national champions or all the awards I've won. It's not really that, you know, it's uh, who's ever on the other side of the net. And I mean this, that hour, that minute, that second, that's my favorite student. So, and that's the way I feel, you know, and mm -hmm. just having the ability, somebody came in to get accredited because they, people watch me teach and I accredit, mm -hmm. I give uh, accreditation uh, to people and he, they're all blown away because when I give a lesson, it's not just biomechanics or technique or footwork or the mental or, you know, it, it's, it's a whole smorgasbord wrapped in one. And I mm -hmm. kind of feel the temperature and then I figure out what I got to do. So no one really influenced me of how I do anything, but I hope because of everything that I've done and I'm still doing, uh, I'm leaving, uh, an imprint on a lot of people to try to pick up a few things that work for Rick Macy. It, it's amazing that you haven't changed, not just your routine, but the style of which you teach, because I feel like a lot of people have gotten into that mindset of adapt or die. And for you, you seem to find the formula that has kept you successful since you were in your early twenties. And the fact that you lost your mustache as well, kind of pisses me off because you should have just kept that thing for the rest of your career. That thing was iconic. <laughs> you know, the one in the movie was a little bushier than mine, but I do have a must. I got a mustache in the drawer here in my office. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I no, love that. But listen, but at the end of the day, you know, when I say I haven't changed, I mean, I meant like how I am as, as a person, you know, mm -hmm. I answer every email. I answer every call. I talk to everybody. It's, it's a different thing. There's not a billion dollar corporation behind me. You know, I'm probably the last of the Mohicans. You know, I've done this since 85. Mm -hmm. Hopman is no longer doing it. Uh, IMG took over Voluntary. Yeah. And no one's really done this longer to me. And I'm, I'm still standing and we had mm -hmm. a great model and we're, uh, we don't have one stop shopping. It's not, we don't do a glorified boarding school. Mm -hmm. So, but the engine is the guy doing this video with you. You know, I, I drive the engine because I'm, yeah. I'm available and I teach like, like I said, 50 hours a week and people come from all over and I do about 20 Zoom videos around the world where I teach people uh, through the computer. So, but, but I love it as much today as I did then. Uh, the only thing that's changed is the education, you mm -hmm. know, because if you're not trying to get better every day and I tell people this, I try to, I learn every day from my students and you know, I, co I coach the kids besides the parents, you know, yes. I mean, I told people just for putting up with Richard for four years, I should be in the hall of fame, you know, just for putting up with Richard. And I kind of laugh about it, but you know, he was my best friend and Serena was my, and Venus were like my daughter. So, um, 
you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I've been blessed, but like every day I just try to get better and prove myself. I, I think you touched on a point that I really wanted to kind of highlight was when you did your interview with Randy at Tennis One, you talked about not just training the kids, but training the parents as well. And that kind of goes back to when you first met Richard. And it seems like in today's day and age, you have a lot of parents that become coaches. And Richard was kind of the first one to pioneer that. What what do you think is the upside and downside to that? Because I, I there are definitely upsides, but I feel like through my eyes and being a realistic person in that sense, what would you say is really tough of working with parents and their kids kind of as a team? You know, first off, another great question. And I hope a lot of parents listen to my answers here because Mm -hmm. it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Uh, You find it a little bit more with the fathers and the girl, you know, daddy's Mm -hmm. little girl, you get more of that and you see it even, you know, percolate into the pro tour. Um, you know, tennis is, in my opinion, like one of the hardest uh, sports to teach from a technical point, if you really understand science and biomechanics, which no parent does, okay? But it's the easiest to teach. If you hit it out, say more topspin. If it goes to the net, you can say bend your knees. So parents, you know, they're living through their kids. So, mm-hmm. um, and so it, it's a slippery slope, but I think the parent has to understand you better know the kid because people are more sensitive people are rougher people are tougher Um, you got to know how to manage this because they're going to look at you as mom and dad first and it's very hard i've seen it be a little more successful with the eastern european european so Mm -hmm. you know there are a lot of russians that i've worked with where they can take a punch more the entitlement the entitlement and just how a lot of the American kids, and I'm not throwing a net uh, over everybody, but they can't maybe, you know, it's a little softer type of thing. Mm -hmm. And you got to be real careful because when these kids get older, which they will, or they get their driver's license or a boyfriend and girlfriend, it's not the kid that burns out a lot. It's the parent because now the kid starts losing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because some of these parents at age 12, they're, they're booking tickets for Wimbledon and most of them are going to be watching Wimbledon. They're not going to be playing. And so exactly. it's, it's very tricky. You got to be more of a psychologist. You got to know when to hug them and when to push them. And you got to know uh, how to push the buttons. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Richard Williams was great at that. And that's why me and him hit it off. This was about me and Venus and Serena. It wasn't mm-hmm. about him. And because of my personality and I know human behavior and I've done this thing for so long, um, I knew how to handle Richard. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, you just got to know when to, you know, listen, when to keep your mouth shut, when to take a deep breath. Cause let's face it. Most of the parents, as you know, are going to say just crazy stuff because everybody has an opinion about everything in life. Everybody has an opinion about everything. So, and you got to respect it. Because if I reacted to every little thing, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'd be doing in today's world if I, if I didn't be able to just, you know, I'm bulletproof. And that's why I tell people all the time, um, you don't overreact, you don't underreact. And how you handle problems, just like a tennis match. Mm-hmm. And having the ability to forget is a big key. But the parents, um, I think to tell the parents, drop the kids off and get out of here, that doesn't work. Because once they lose a little bit, then they're going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I I let the parents come on the court. I let them pick up balls. I have interaction with the parents all the time. And some parents, this is, you'll love this. Some parents are there telling kind of me what to do, or they might regurgitate. (laughs) They regurgitate what I've already said, like it was their idea the next day. And, you know, it's like, I'm going, I, 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 well, I don't even want to say what I probably could say. And I just yeah. nod my head and I, you, I just. You can probably say it. Yeah, it's, it's beyond crazy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but they're living through their kid. And mm-hmm. this happens more from like age eight to 14. Yes. Then when they get a little older, it starts to disappear. But mm-hmm. you got to be real careful. The, the parent coaching the kid, you better really know your kid. Because I've seen these things blow up mm-hmm. more than you're going to see like what happened with the Williams sisters. Would you say who's more fragile, the kid or the parent? Um, I would say probably the kid when they're younger, mm-hmm. but the parent 
as the kid gets a little older. Um, because I, I, can, I can flip the script and change the narrative when a kid 12 years old hits three balls in the row in the net or hits the ball out. And I, the parents like, how could you, do, you know, your parents just, yeah. you can imagine what they say. Mm -hmm. And they start telling me kind of what, what went wrong. And I say, okay, let's just back the truck up a second. How, how did you hit the ball when you were 12? And they go, well, uh, I never played. And I said, well, that's a starting point. You don't know how they feel mentally. You don't, there's a lot more going on here. Just trust me on this. Let me put Humpty Dumpty together. Let me, let me just do my thing. You can have your opinion, but you know, a lot of these kids are going to be uptight. They don't handle pressure. They're not relaxed. It's not just what happened to my forehand. The forehand could be bad because of the mm -hmm. footwork. The forehand could be bad because they got nervous. The mm -hmm. forehand could be bad because of the tactic they use. There's many, there's many spokes here of why people miss. And unless you've been doing this and you know how to reverse engineer things and come up and correct things, because I can probably correct things more than anybody in the world as far as how to put things together quicker or correct mm -hmm. things. So, and that takes, I didn't know this when I started and I mm -hmm. know more today than I did 10 years ago. So uh, there's more to it than just hit it higher over the net and, you know, mm -hmm. good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's true. And I feel like a lot of people, especially parents, when they first come into the sport, they really want to learn everything. They want to adapt. They want to, they want to make sure that they know the right thing. So in case a coach doesn't come to a tournament with them, they can say what their coach has been saying. Now there's a lot of communication through text, videos, emails, uh, here and there too. And I feel like for kids, and this is from my own personal experience too, when you have a parent that wants to know every update, I feel like that can hinder them as well. No, no question about it. You know, when you're calling balls and strikes uh, every single day and you're keeping score, it can ruin family, families it can stimulate divorce it ruins family vacations it helps it hurts the other siblings yeah. i could go on and on with the medley of problems that this creates but i tell people listen i know you want to be ranked number one in every age group i can name a 200 people that are number one 12 14 16 18 and you've never heard of it this is called junior development not yeah. junior final destination yeah and this thing changes i've had the best okay uh, kids ever, Capriati, she won the 18s as a 12-year-old. Tommy Ho won the 18s as a 15-year-old. Those records still stand today. Tommy never got past 82 in the world, maybe because some athletic uh, limitation. Jennifer was just, you know, mind-boggling. I tell this people all the time, a 12-year-old Capriati would have beat a 12-year-old Venus or Serena 0 and 0 because she was just more mature and had better mm -hmm. technique at a young age. So it's not where you start. It's just like life. It's where you finish. So, but the parents want it all now. They want the kid to win every match, go undefeated, yeah. be the best. And there's no correlation. I mean, if you're having success early on, I guess that's better than nothing. But mm -hmm. I'll say it again. I picked up a racket. See, that's why I understand it. I picked up a racket at 12 years old and I never had a lesson in my life. And here I am, as I said, I was like one in Ohio Valley at 18 one of the best in players in uh, Ohio and I teach more lessons than anybody in the country now. So people have to, the parents have to understand that. And the ones that have played sports, whether it be Olympic, NBA, NFL, cause I've seen it all mm -hmm. hockey. The ones that have been there and done that, those are the ones I click with. And yeah. that's why I click with Richard, even mm -hmm. though, he always said he played for the Harlem Clowns. I never knew. I knew the Globetrotters, but not the Clowns. <laughs> uh, me and him, we just, he got it. And I understood mm -hmm. what he wanted to do and how he, how he looked at this thing. And that's, I mean, that's why I love the guy because we were on the same page and I knew that it was all about getting better, uh, trying to improve every day. He wasn't, he didn't want to play junior tennis. He said, Rick, Rick, if I play junior tennis, I'm going to end up in jail. That's what he told me. He goes, I'm not going to get caught up in this nonsense. I think he even showed that a little bit in the movie. Yeah. So that, that's why I love the guy. And I don't recommend that, obviously, for other players because yeah. Venus and Srina were brutal competitors. But, um, yeah, this is a long-term process. Everybody has to exhale. It's not where you start, where you finish. You should be trying to shoot for, like, a college scholarship. Mm -hmm. And anything after that is icing on the cake.
I a hundred percent agree. And that kind of brings me to my next question for you, because with junior players and seeing what you did for Venus and Serena and Richard and their family was unbelievable. And I, I wanted to kind of touch on what kind of promises should coaches or should they make any promises to junior players, whether you're going to provide them something or whether you're not going to provide them something, because I feel like that's a big thing when people start looking for coaches, especially at a higher level. Yeah. Um, first off, another great question. I don't think, I don't think they should offer them anything. Uh, mm. Even though, even though I did that back in the day, I'll uh, get into that in a second, mm-hmm. but it should be, it should be all business. You know, you're not going to mm-hmm. go into a restaurant and say, I'm going to try this for a year and then I might pay you later. I don't yeah. think those things, or I want this, you know, maybe you want a celebrity to eat at your restaurant so other people would come. I think when coaches get into that, uh, you can never service or provide the service you want to that player. So I think it should be more, you know, business, your time, you get paid, whatever, whatever, whatever. To start getting into other than sweat equity, if someone had to come out of like, like with money or, or thing, that's that those things never work. You know, that's what an agent does, or maybe an investor might get into that type of thing. But for tennis coaches to get into that, mm-hmm. it's just so dangerous because things change and people lose and other people get in your, their ear when they're not at the tournament with them. Yeah. Or, you know, the ball toss is too low or they, here's a way to do it. Cause everybody's an expert as we know. So mm-hmm. I think you got to be a coach. I would tell it to any coach. I wouldn't go down that path. And mm-hmm. the only reason why um, I did that, uh, with Venus and Serena. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've never done it since and wouldn't do that again. Mm. This was so different. You know, yeah. uh, I just, I, I just bonded with the whole family immediately, even before we got onto the court. And then when I saw the speed, the quickness, the athleticism, when things got cleaned up and I'm sitting there going, listen, I, I can make this thing happen. Because I believe in me, it would take a lot of time, four or five hours a day with me, which that's the wild card. I yeah. mean, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of time and a lot of money, just if I spent that much time. That means I'm not spending it with someone, you know, paying $800 an hour or whatever they're going to pay. So mm-hmm. I, I just, that was one thing. But the way I'm saying was different because they live in California and I'm in Florida yeah. and they had to move. So there was this major undertaking and I'm just glad I was kind of in a position uh, to do it, but it was still a risk. They mm-hmm. could have got catastrophically, there could have been an injury yeah. or who knows how it could have blown up or I could have been wrong, which I knew I wasn't because I saw stuff inside these kids. The, listen, the outside was crazy. There was arms, legs, hair, tentacles, beads were flying off their head. It was like, it was crazy. And remember, I had Capriati for three yeah. years. She had her knees bent in the parking lot. Her racket was back by the late, great Jimmy Everett. I mean, the ball was on a string. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was poetry in motion. And then I go to Compton, and this was like, you know, a twister. And a hurricane yeah. just, they were everywhere. And Venus had these long arms and legs. So I wasn't impressed at first. I thought maybe 60, 70 in the nation. But then when they started competing, it was, I'm telling you, it was brutal. I, I've seen a lot. I never saw two little girls run so hard and almost fall over to get a ball. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be great. That mm-hmm. might help you in anything in life. But I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. Six feet, 160, 511, you know, 150, could quick, fast, strong, and they would go for the jugular. When yeah. we started competing, it blew me away. So that's when... I went up to Richard and I said, let me tell you something. You got the next female Michael Jordan on your hand. And he puts his arm around me, goes, no brother, man, I got the next two. So that's in the movie, by the way. And that went global around the world. And I knew they could transcend the sport. It was bigger than Rick Macy. I just knew what I could do. And I saw their potential. Uh, And they they not only checked every box, they checked a few more. And Mm -hmm. plus I love the girls. They were, they were, they were just like, great kids and that's a big thing you know you don't want to you don't want to be teaching some spoiled brat i mean mm-hmm. that's like a root canal you know how yep. that goes so so it, it was a package but then when they got into i want a salary fifty four thousand, 
yeah. or a motor home that was 92,000. I mean, this got into crazy hundreds of hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of dollars yeah. that I had to make that decision. But you know wow. what? Whether it took four years, eight years, it, it didn't matter because I mm -hmm. knew what I could do. And I believed in the girls so much that I knew where this could go. And um, so I didn't look at it as a risk. And I think as a coach, you know, you, I love challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, Jennifer was gone by then, but yeah. it had nothing to do with her being gone by then. She was top 10 in the world on the pro tour. It was just more me. I saw something that I've never seen in my life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people didn't see it. Yeah. And I saw it. And besides my time, I put up the cheddar. And I yeah. put up the money. That's a whole, that's a whole different thing. And mm -hmm. as they say, I guess the rest is history. Yeah, it, it <laughs> yeah. really, it really is. And I actually wanted to ask you two more questions of, about Richard. One, yeah. the contract, was that real? Which one? The, the one that Richard gave to you in the scene where he hands you their contract after you handed them yours. Yeah. Um, Maybe not exactly like that, but mm -hmm. I had my idea of here's how it's going to go. Mm -hmm. But his idea was like the whole family. Wow. So, to answer your question, yes. Wow. And there was many layers to it. Like I said, mm -hmm. a salary. I, when he said, he said a motor home, I thought he meant a mobile home because they lived oh. in like this little, sh they lived in yeah. this little shack in Compton. I thought it was a mobile home. I didn't know yeah. it was going to be a motor home with a bedroom and a TV. And I, it was like, it was crazy. I, I mean, you know, the car I was driving was like 30,000 and here yeah. I am spending 92,000 for a motor home. They drove from California and a, you know, you know, a million dollar condo on that. There was, yeah. there was so many layers to this. Um, but yeah, that is true because it wasn't just me coaching the girls. Yeah. They had to move and they needed money. And they mm -hmm. did a place to live and they needed food. And mm -hmm. that, that's, that was one part. That was the peripheral. But remember this, four or five hours a day, six days a week with Rick Macy. That doesn't sound like a lot, maybe to some people, but take that times 365 days. And the cast of characters, the hitting partners, yeah. <laughs> the people. I mean, to keep my hands around this, uh, I mean, I should have got coach of the year just for just that performance. So, but, <laughs> so my point is, so my point is, um, yeah, it was a major, major undertaking. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, Reebok wasn't there. Nike wasn't there. Yeah. It wasn't IMG. It wasn't some big company. Um, and I'm glad, I'm really glad. So I didn't know how the movie was going to come out initially. Mm -hmm. It showed a couple things. Um, how much I cared mm -hmm. about the girls and the family. And really how much Rick Macy did and believed to make this happen. So mm -hmm. I think the story, as we all know, it might sound better. Oh, I went from Compton to center court. Yeah. But those four years, those four years at the academy um, and what they look like technically, strategically and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then when I took Venus to make her debut and she beats 57 in the world and almost beats number one, mm -hmm. as, as the late great Bud Collins said, you know, they were hibernating at Rick Macy Academy, training all the time. She walks off a street, <laughs> beats 57 in the world, and almost number one. You know, forget the 69 Mets, forget Rocky yeah. Balboa. This is like, this, you don't, this is fairy tale stuff. But yeah. something happened. And it's, I go back to what you asked me earlier. I just, you know, I helped. I, I just knew what I could do mm -hmm. because I knew what I had. You yeah. know what I mean? And I knew I had a father, believe it or not, I could work with. I mean, mm -hmm. Richard was the nicest guy, even though he comes across stubborn and mm -hmm. people think he's a lunatic, a maniac, and whatever. That was on the outside, but in the inside, a world-class father. I saw how he orchestrated and interacted with those girls, same with mm -hmm. the wife, on a regular basis. And that came out loud and clear in the movie. And so, to me, uh, that's why I respect the guy so much. Uh, no matter what he said or did, because mm -hmm. he's out there saying crazy things. And then yeah. here I am having to defend it, you know, all the time back in the day, you know, like, but it didn't matter because he was, he was a great dad and that trumped everything in yeah. my opinion. I a hundred percent agree. And the other one, I was really curious about this, the tapes that Richard made with his home video camera, 
how many have you seen? Because I feel like that was one of the most curious things I ever saw in the movie when it came to the behind the scenes, because I feel like that has some gold that everyone needs to see. Yeah, no, I, I saw them all. Okay. Oh. Believe me. No, I've seen, I've seen them all. And they were, they were at the credits at the end of the movie. You know, I saw the one to Vic Braden. I, I saw just all the video. I mean, this guy, listen, when I first came there, he pulled out his tripod and put me on camera. And it was like, I was in a deposition. I thought, wait, <laughs> this guy was asking me, he was like grilling me and he, 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 he recorded everything. Mm -hmm. Even when the kids were like 10, 11, 12, 13, he would go home after dinner, put up the tripod and do interviews with the girls to prepare them for the future. That's amazing. I mean, no, no, it's, that's insane. Is that like, <laughs> is that like, is that in, is that life lessons or what? Now, yeah. a lot of people might do that. Mm -hmm. but you better have the candy. You better exactly. have the goods. You know, I mean, that's just kind of ludicrous. That's mm -hmm. the cart way, way, way before the horse. And, but look how they speak. Look how they look in the eye. They're very educated. They used to bring their books. I wish this was in the movie. They brought their books every day to the courts, mm -hmm. put them under the canopy. If it rained, he'd go, go to Rick's office and study. Wow. So these are the, and every night after practice, good, bad, happy, sad, mad. Rick, thank you very much you know, look me in the eye, these little girls, even though they were rough and tough, they, that's why it was, a, it's hard for people to understand the relationship. And I mm -hmm. think they get a better uh, picture from the movie. I think they get a, like a better picture, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, the videotape, uh, yeah, I, I saw it all. And there's, 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 there's a lot more. I mean, there's a lot more. Plus you got to remember CBS, NBC, yeah. ABC, Transworld. Forget Richard's stuff. You got to understand there was literally hundreds of stuff done around mm -hmm. the world. Like Venus was almost legendary because mm -hmm. I'm saying, well, Richard's saying she's the next whatever. And I'm saying she's better than Capriati, mm -hmm. you know, and her little sister might be better. This thing was like back page then sports page and then front page. This thing. So you got to understand how many magazine covers or print besides television mm -hmm. and that could just add pressure yeah. but it seemed like it made venus and serena more bulletproof so it was it was crazy but i, I love the movie and i'm glad it came out the way it did because i think you know it really shows especially everybody in tennis mm -hmm. they get a very different picture of exactly what happened and how much you know i cared about the girls and what i did to make this whole thing happen i totally agree um I think a lot of people don't understand, not just in today's day and age with technology, but the amount of pressure people they had, especially when Venus won 60, 60 plus junior matches and wasn't beaten and then goes into a pro tour and just saying, yeah, I'm just going to play and win. Like that, I feel like from that perspective, all those news agencies were just hoping for them to fail. Great. There's a great question. You're very insightful and knowledgeable about this because no, you're right. At the Bank of the West Classic, there was like, there was like, uh, there was like 22 media credentials given out the year before. Mm -hmm. And when Venus made her debut, there was 252. It was crazy. We were seven mm -hmm. deep practicing. And most of them wanted her to fail, even the players. Mm -hmm. Think about it. You're getting all this publicity and you never, you're like legendary and you hadn't even played. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. So, and then you throw in Richard, you know, blowing the smoke. Yeah. And then you got the African American card and you got all these mm -hmm. other things. And then, you know, I'm saying how good they're going to be. And uh, all I knew was one thing. And I tell this to everybody, you don't, you don't know what the mind's going to do. Yeah. Um, she could, she could have freaked out and lost so and oh. But people, if they have a, a brain and an eye, like I can see that you are very insightful about this. Thank you. Uh, they would see, they would see this tall girl, this little kid from Compton, California, five foot 11, that runs like a gazelle, hits open stance all over the court, cuts the court, understood the geometry of the court, mm -hmm. okay? I had a, had a big serve already. And when you're off balance, she was at the net. And, mm -hmm. she, and so they would just see something. Because back in the 90s, if you were big and strong, you weren't yeah. nimble. You no. weren't nimble. You they were, were going to bring a different deal. So 
whether she won or lost, they, if anybody had a brain, they would say, this kid's going to be great, maybe number one. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm hearing, her little sister might, might be better. Mm -hmm. But for her to step up, listen, she never even won any matches at the academy. She yeah. was playing people two, three years older, boys. They would squish her like a bug, like a bug. Wow. And I, I tell her by this story, Gerard, one of the hitting partners who went with us to Oakland in 94, mm -hmm. she played Gerard. He was a lefty. So much top spin, a kick serve, it'd go over her head. I mean, he played, he played for Davis Cup Congo, whatever that means. He was like four or 500 in the world, but he could yeah. kill her any time. He would just like destroy her. Mm -hmm. She never beat him. So the day of the tournament, listen to this. I, and I told Venus this at the after party. She was like breaking up laughing. Um, I, go, <laughs> I, go, I go, Gerard, make it go into a tiebreaker okay. and let her clip you at the wire. So they're playing the day of the tournament. She played Stafford that night. Yeah. They go into a tiebreaker, hit 20 ball rallies. She beats Gerard in a tiebreaker. Now think about this. You never beat someone for three and a half years. Yeah. And then you beat them the day you're making your debut. And she comes off the court. She goes, Rick, Rick, I'm peaking at the right time. I'm peaking at the right time. And I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah. Because I, as a coach, I wanted her to feel amazing and mm -hmm. get that motivational carrot out there. So she was feeling even more amazing and confident. Yeah. But then for her to go out there, slow start. But for her to go out there and win 6'4", six, 6'3", and I see that little girl like a human pogo stick yeah. jumping up and down at the net and that face and the beef, that's been with me my whole life. And to me, that alone was what this was all about for three and a half years to that mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Because right then and there, I knew this girl, no doubt, showed the whole world uh, she's going to be number one in the world someday. That's it, it's truly amazing the story that yeah. you you help create honestly with the Williams sisters and Richard and kind of the future of the sport because without them we wouldn't have seen the generation of talent that we have in today's day and age and I really appreciate you Rick coming on and talking to me and just being honest about this whole situation because I feel like a lot of people need more down to earth and more reality checks that you provide and this positivity that you radiate. I mean, that smile is contagious. Thank you. I really appreciate it, Rick. All right. We'll do it again. Have a yeah. good day. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank you.